I'd like to share with you a story about a really special kid. Now, I've been working at camp in some capacity for the last 11 years. I've met a lot of kids, and many of them hold a special place in my heart. But when asked why I do camp, this boy's face comes to mind as one of the reasons. So it was my first summer working as a program director, and we were a few weeks into the summer. It was Monday at lunch, and we had a new group of kids. And among this new group of kids was a young boy who previous staff remembered. And unfortunately, not for the best reasons. This boy, we'll call him Matt, was known as an angry and aggressive boy who, when bored, would make up his own type of fun. And Matt was a smart little guy, so he would get bored pretty quick. Matt had been placed in a cabin with a group of staff who were really skilled at de-escalation and were incredibly patient. And so far, things had been, well, like, as good as expected. <laughs> um, but now it was lunch, and we were about to learn some new info about Matt. Turns out, little Matt had a se severe aversion to condiments. Mayo, mustard, and the king condiment when working with kids, ketchup. So strong was this aversion that he could not be around it without causing a loud scene and becoming nauseous. Working with the staff of the cabin, we decided that the easiest solution would be for a staff member to sit with Matt at a separate table during meals where condiments were used. And with the other things that were happening at the time and those staff members in the cabin, it just worked best for me to sit with Matt. This began, began a week-long event of me sitting with Matt at lunches and suppers, just the two of us at a table. And during this time, I got to know Matt really well. And after that first Monday lunch, his cabin leader mentioned that there was a change in Matt. Even previous staff members made comments on it later in the week. Matt wasn't quite as angry or aggressive anymore. He was engaging in the activities at camp, and he was making friends in his cabin. This wasn't the kid that we'd met the day before. So what happened? Matt got to experience relationship, specific care for him individually. Matt experienced something that was true for each and every one of us. We're created for relationship. And when we experience that, it begins to change us. From the very beginning, page one as it were, relationship has been key. Genesis 1.26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let us make man, us. This is the first clue we have of the Trinity, that God himself exists in relationship, in our image, made to be like him. Thus, if he exists in relationship, why should we not also? Just like Matt experiencing relationship and the change happening inside of him, we see examples of this throughout scripture as well. Except instead of interpersonal relationship between humans, these individuals experience relationship with God that changes them. Human to human relationship, it's wonderful. It's good, but it's not the best. We have need of each other, but that deep void within each of our souls will continue to lack without the filling of the one true God. He who created us back in the garden has been weaving the story of redemption back to relationship with him since Adam and Eve left the garden. Throughout all of scripture, we see individuals' lives changed because they experience relationship with God. We have Peter, who even though he was a disciple of Christ for three years, denies knowing him. But later, he has a real heart to heart with Christ, and he goes on to proclaim the gospel boldly to Judea, healing people, and even continuing to speak furiously to authorities, though he's under arrest. We have the rest of the disciples as well, who struggled to grasp much of what Jesus taught while they were with him. Much of it only sunk in once he ascended to heaven. Before these men knew Jesus, they were fishermen, tax collectors, zealots. But after their time with Jesus, they went on to proclaim the good news of Christ. A name that might easily come to mind of someone changing after an encounter with Christ is Paul. In Acts 9, we read of his transformation. He was still breathing threats and murmuring against the disciples, and he has a life-changing meeting with Christ. And from this time, he goes on to boldly declare the gospel to gent Gentiles all over teaching and admonishing believers to continual growth in becoming more like Christ. <coughs> and then we have the woman at the well. John 4, 1 to 29, and then 39 to 42. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. He had to pass through Samaria, 
So he came to a town of Samaria called Sakar, near the field of Jacob, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So G Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. This woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where are you going to get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come draw water again. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to her, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the father. You worship what you do not know. You worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming is, and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then, the disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek, or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went into town and said to the people, Come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He said, He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there three two more days. And many more believe because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Now there's a lot that can be pulled out of this passage, uh, but today I just want to focus on the change that we see within the woman. In the beginning of the passage, we find Jesus coming to the well around the sixth hour. So that would be around noon. It would have been hot, the sun's heat encouraging everyone to take a rest, but it was at this time that this woman chooses to show up and draw water. This small detail tells, telling us the time and that the woman had come to draw water gives us a peek into who this woman is before Jesus even begins talking to her. She comes to the well when she knows the other woman won't be around. She doesn't have community with them. If she did, she would not come to do such a task in the heat of the day, but instead wait till the cool of the evening or the morning as the other woman did. And as this woman approaches, Jesus steps into relationship with her, drawing her into conversation. He takes the initiative to speak with her. She's a Samaritan, and speaking with her was against Jewish cultural norms. And yet, Jesus does it, for we're all called to relationship with him. Jesus draws her in, engaging her in conversation that pierces her heart, bringing forward that which he has her shunned from her community, drawing water in the heat of the day. He clearly states to her that he is the Messiah she has been waiting for. And, when we see, uh, and then we see that she goes to town to tell the others of who she has met. There's a shift here. She previously was unable to be in the presence of these people to retrieve one of the most basic needs of life, water. And after meeting with Christ, after stepping into relationship with him, she leaves her water jar, suggesting that there is some haste in, that, in, where, in, where, in her leaving and telling the others of her, of him. These are two very different responses. It is like what we get, got to see in Matt when he experienced relationship and not someone just trying to manage his bad behavior. 
Now, I'm not in any way attempting to compare myself to Christ. <laughs> a relationship with Christ satisfies more than one with me or anyone else ever could. To know the one who created us, that is the best thing. But in my interactions with Matt, in seeing him and not just seeing the problems he was causing, it allowed him to have a good week at camp. Hopefully, he carried on with him the knowledge that he was worth lo being loved, but not ultimately by me. The hope is that it wasn't me being reflected to him, but Christ, and that he might one day know of God's deep love for him. When we look at our own lives, are there places where we are like the woman at the well? Do we close ourselves off from others, or even from God, ashamed of what we've done, or fearful of the scorn we may receive? Do we hide away our pains or mask our brokenness with a smile and a joke, always redirecting to something else, never allowing anyone to get close, never allowing people to meet us at the well? Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. We need relationship. We were built for it. It is at our very core. It even says in 1 Corinthians 12 that each of us who believe in Christ make up a part of his body. How would this body work if it wasn't in connection, in relationship with each other? I encourage each of us today to look at our own hearts and ask what it is that is keeping us from ultimate relationship. What is holding us back from God? What is the truth that would combat the lies that are keeping us away? I'm not quite sure what those are. Well, we have a blessed thing in having the body where others will walk alongside of us, reflecting Christ and his truth back to us. Let us reach out and seek out relationship today.